Yeah, I see it. Hi everyone, this is Pam Sari from the Asian American and Asian Research and Cultural Center. I hope you're doing well today. Um, I'm here with Tisha Lee, the CEO of the Tippecanoe Arts Federation. So and we're going to talk about her work. So hi Tisha, how are you? Hi, I'm really well, how are you? Doing good. So let's start with um, introduction about your life. I actually watched a presentation where you express your gratitude for the public arts program when you were little and that got me. I really want, wanted to know you um, and that's why I contacted you. So can we start with introduction about you, your life, your childhood, and how you got interested in the arts? Sure. So um, I give a lot of credit to obviously my, my grandparents and specifically my maternal grandparents. Um, they came over and opened up the first Chinese restaurant in Northwest Indiana. So um, that was called Cam Lan. And um, some folks are somewhat familiar with it because it was also referenced in the movie, A Christmas Story. So at the end, when the dogs eat the turkey and they have to go somewhere for Christmas, they end up going to a Chinese restaurant. So that was kind of modeled after my grandfather's restaurant because the author of A Christmas Story, the short story, Gene Shepard, also grew up in Hammond, Indiana. And so um, that's where the basis of our family in the Midwest really started. And uh, all of my family is artistic. So uh, my grandfather, my grandmother, culinary geniuses. Um, my father is a chef. Um, my mother was very artistic. Um, and actually the first drawings that I saw were hers from her sketchbook growing up. And um, living so close to Chicago, um, you know, the Art Institute of Chicago was really my second home and provided a lot of education, a lot of uh, influence into my life. And, and really, uh, my parents have always been supportive of um, pursuing the arts, uh, just that, despite my best efforts to uh, just be that bad kid and just be like, I'm going to go to art school, but they were fully supportive of it. Um, so I felt at that time, because they supported my decision to go to art school, that I really needed to be successful with it. And uh, I had some wonderful professors that um, helped to helped me to perfect my craft. So I'm a classically trained uh, painter, mm -hmm. and really with the uh, style of the academy is my background. And uh, when I'm not doing arts administration, um, I, I'm painting and I'm also doing uh, sculpture. So, uh, but for now, I'm basically a collector of art. Mm -hmm. So this piece right here. Um, oh, yes. And we, um, we basically, um, well, I came here 12 years ago to work for the Tippecanoe Arts Federation. Uh, essentially, it's an organization that is part of the state's regional arts partnership program. And that's something that I've been involved with for the last 23 years. So, um, the my influence really for pursuing the arts was making that transformative difference right so um i was definitely in a position in my life where with two parents out of the house because they were um you know trying to provide um you know food and shelter for us so um and also provide my brother and i with a life that was less difficult than the life that they and their parents had to deal with as you know first generation or you know as immigrants over to um the the country so um one of the one of the things that helped me refocus my life was the arts because you know it was something that again my family had been supportive of my teachers had been very um very complimentary of and it gave me a path in the life so that i could have easily gone to jail or you know um you know ended up dead somewhere for making really bad decisions but the art showed me the right path and they gave me something that i was very passionate about and something and a way to express myself when words failed me so um, that expressive nature was um, the biggest draw for me and being able to share 
my sort of visual vocabulary with other people and for them to understand the point of view uh, is just uh, something that got me really excited about the, about the arts in general. And obviously being very active in the community for the last several years has, has helped me just continue to um, remain educated on uh, current trends and also those individuals that the artists of the past that have influenced where we are right now. And especially during this time of COVID where artists are working and a lot of the most incredible thought provoking work comes out of um, instances like this, just snapshots in history that um, really cause us to think deeply about who we are as a society and as a people. Right. right. Yeah. I, I really like that story. And if I may backtrack a little bit, when did you realize, I mean, you were always surrounded by you know, people who were very supportive and um, early on, right, taught you the love of, of the arts. How will you decide to make it your own pursuit after that? What did you do? Maybe through your schooling, your education, what, how did you make it your own? Yeah, so. Um, did that happen? Yeah, and again, you know, it's not the it's not the best story, but it's my story. Uh, you know, so all like K through 12, was very active and taking, you know, the arts as an elective and, you know, part of the honor society and all of those things, right? And then it came to making the decision about college. And um, I didn't have a college fund. My parents weren't able to set up a college fund for me or anything. And um, I was, I am the only person in my immediate family to have gone and to have graduated from college. Um, it, and, and again, I was, again not a great story but i was really just trying to see if my parents would get a rise out of me saying i wanted to go to art school and then when i when i was shocked genuinely when they were like yes we support you at that point i said you know what if i'm if if they're being supportive of me going to art school i have to make a success out of this and that's really the turning point during my you know undergraduate it was still kind of seeking out what specific discipline which avenue of the arts i wanted to pursue um and again that's evolved over time when i graduated with my masters i thought i would teach at the universities and i did that and i did that for five years um but i was also working perhaps like three or four other jobs um and one of them was with a not-for-profit arts council, which I had done as an intern my senior year of high school uh, for an arts council. And that work felt more fulfilling because the work that we were doing was filling the gaps of, um, of young people like me who weren't brought up with privilege or with means um, for all intents and purposes, you know, grew up very poor, um, but my parents worked very hard. So that instilled in me a really strong work ethic. Um, but I wanted to really provide those opportunities to other young people. So they would also have an alternative path to, you know, getting into trouble, which was where I found myself, um, you know, as a teenager and really angsty and you know, and, and being a, a minority in a predominantly um, white community. And, but having the, the great fortune of living so close to a major city where I saw that those things and those amenities existed, but it wasn't on an everyday basis that I was interacting with individuals of color, so. Mm -hmm. um, that's wonderful. And that made me think, did you also realize at that point um, that connection between your, you know, racial identity and maybe ethnic identity and um, the arts, as as you as you do it as you get more involved? Um, how how did how did that look like to you? Well, I think as I've gotten older, I've become more aware. Um, of my cultural background, if that makes any sense, because, you know, for a long time, I think it was just wanting to fit in. When I was young, I think like most kids, I was just really trying to fit in. And, you know, most of the people around me are all white. Um, and so, um, 
and, and I was very fortunate to not be bullied at school. Um, I can probably count the instances where I was aware of being discriminated against on my hand. Fortunately, it was a different situation for my brother, who I was well, who was bullied a lot in school. Um, and you know, as I've as I've gotten older, I recognize, and maybe more so, so now in, in this community, um, how much I was missing out by really not embracing my cultural heritage. Um, anything that made me different, I was super self-conscious of. Like my mom would send me to school occasionally with a bow, you know? And I remember one time a friend of mine you know, bit into it thinking it was just like a dinner roll. And she made just this terrible face. And I felt like, I felt embarrassed and just, and I started just eating school lunch, you know, instead of bringing my own because of that hyper awareness. But I find that I'm rooted now in my culture and that I'm very proud to have the upbringing that I have and that I am an advocate and I will call people out when they are being, um, when they are discriminating against folks of color because I recognize that, again, educating myself about this institutional racism that is in our community, how much harder we as women have had to work, we have minority women have had to work um, and to, you know, or, you know, when I came in to this town, I was 12 years younger and just that discrimination with being younger and, you know, having to really prove myself 300 times um, more than, you know, a white male of any color. Um, so, but, and, and the roots of all of that are in the fact that, my, you know, my family immigrated here and that they wished for something better for this next generation. And I feel like in order to honor their sacrifice and their struggle, I absolutely have to be loud and proud about all of the, all of the great things that they have made me. That's beautiful, Tisha. And it's, it's you know, as you talked about the, the food, right? The, school and food that you bring from home. We actually, yesterday at the, for our social media, our ARC staff, we, we decided to do a, a challenge among, among ourselves to make something um, that's related, rooted in Asian and Asian American um, food. So we baked, we cooked, and then we asked people to vote, um, which, which dish that they want us to create over on our YouTube channel. So that was, that was really nice. And when we were talking, we actually discussed, okay, this, we are not doing this just for fun, but what are some of the experiences that we had around food and being, being you know, mocked, um, bullied around what food we brought from home? That, was, that came up um, quite a bit. So yes. Definitely what you just said. Yes, I, I, that's, that's really true. So yeah, everyone, if you're watching this um, and you have not followed us, um, we are at, at Purdue, A-A-A-R-C-C, -C, and you can see some of the stories that we, we talked about. So Tisha, and after that, how did you become involved with the Tippecanoe Arts Federations? What was that story? So, um, you know, I've been working in the not-for-profit sector for over 20 years and just working for different, you know, regional arts partners. So each one of us is responsible for a geographic location in, um, in, in the state of Indiana. So we have 92 counties. The Tippecanoe Arts Federation is um, responsible for 14 counties, um, including Tippecanoe. And um, prior to me being here, I have worked with three other um, partners. So one in Northwest Indiana, then one in Terre Haute by Indiana State University, not the other school. <laughs> and, um, and, and then uh, in Portland, Indiana, which is on the Indiana-Ohio border. And the language that the state uses is, is unique. So um, when my previous boss got a call from the search committee 
from the Tippecanoe Arts Federation, um, they said, we need, we need help here. Um, we need a director. We need someone who is familiar with the state rules, guidelines, regulations, and vocabulary. And so they called him three times and then finally said, you need to send her over. So he actually kicked me out of the nest to come over to Lafayette. And um, I didn't know I was going to be here that long, but I do really like the community and I'm very close to my family and also my in-laws, but just far enough from each so they don't just drive by the house, you know? So it's perfect. <laughs> perfect. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, me too. I, I want to know more about the Tippecanoe New Arts Federation itself. Can you tell us more about the work that you do? Sure. Um, well, probably the thing that most folks know about is the Taste of Tippecanoe. A lot of folks don't know that it is, one, a fundraiser for the arts and cultural sector, not only just in Tippecanoe County, but our entire service area. And it is the single largest fundraising event for the arts in the entire state of Indiana. So it's raised... Um, you know, millions of dollars over, over the years. It would have been 39 this year um, if, we were, if we had held it in its uh, regular outdoor festival environment. Mm -hmm. But um, we're really promoting the culinary arts, which are probably some of my favorites because I love to eat, and um, also uh, performing arts. So whether it's a musician, an actor, um, or folks that are visually putting artwork together. We have all of those featured there at the Taste. Um, in addition to that, we do a craft beer festival on top of the parking garage, and that's Tap for Taff. Um, really a partnership with our craft brewers around the state. Our gallery walk series, which happens three times a year um, in May, July, and September. And that's where we're opening up downtown Lafayette and partnering uh, businesses with artists so that they can either perform in front of their venue or hang artwork in their in their establishment. Mm -hmm. um, we also uh, have an exhibition series that goes on in our building. So every month we're flipping the exhibit. So we feature uh, three or more artists in each of our galleries at the Wells Building. And then our arts education programming is really uh, intended to meet the needs of our at-risk and underserved populations. So mm -hmm. we have the after-school arts program, which we call it ASAP. And so those are free classes to young people that um, are just really interested in learning more about, you know, drawing, painting. Um, we have a, we have a, a two turntable so they can learn how to DJ and like scratch records and stuff like that. They can learn how to play the guitar, the ukulele, the violin, all of these things, which are um, again, uh, very, uh, very accessible for some, but if cost becomes an issue, then obviously our, um, our benefit is, I'm sorry, I think I lost you. Oh no, I'm here. Okay, sorry, someone's calling me, sorry. Okay, um, you're fine. But, uh, and then we have our art reach lending library, instrument lending library. So for any young person who is in school and who is enrolled in band or orchestra, they can borrow an instrument from our lending library for up to seven years or until they graduate from high school. And, you know, instruments can be really expensive. Uh, young people can be very fickle about which instrument to play. I know I played the flute, percussion, and the piano and just ended up you know, painting instead, but uh, that was probably a nightmare for my parents. Um, and we have the mural program, which again, you know, you, you mentioned my affinity for public art and mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's something that's probably my favorite program if I have to, had to mm. pick. And that's just because it, it provides the arts and accessibility, that level of um, equality to everyone. Mm -hmm. So, it's not making you feel uncomfortable by having to go into a specific location. You can really be anywhere and see it and, um, you know, and enjoy it, take a selfie with it. Just, um, and I think it's a really strong indicator of the quality of life that a particular community has and the investment from its leadership into its uh, citizens' quality of life because it really beautifies areas, but 
demonstrates that it's welcoming. So very important there. And then our visiting artist program, which we have, we're, we're, we're um, connecting with community centers, schools, and libraries to provide uh, professional artists in any discipline to their community. Um, because for instance, a majority of our communities that we serve are rural, so they don't have um, organizations that are there with the capacity to you know, teach how to throw on a um, ceramic wheel or um, do a, a raccoon firing. So we'll hire one of our artists and we'll send them over there so they can share with that community. And again, for us, it's really about um, equality and um, making sure that uh, we are um, really leveling the playing field for any community. So despite their isolated geography or their socioeconomic status, we're making sure that um, they do have access to the arts and the ability to engage at a level that they're comfortable with. Right, no, that's, those are amazing programs. And if later you would like to, maybe I can ask you to send some of these uh, info on your website, links, resources that you would like to, us to include um, on our website, I would be happy to do so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, with COVID-19 situation right now, how has this been impacting the work that you do? And if there is something that you would like to announce also to our campus community, uh, please do so. Okay, wonderful. So, um, unfortunately, yeah, we've had to cancel a, a number of events. Um, the first one that we had to cancel was our craft beer uh, tasting. And we have subsequently had to um, cancel quite a few of our gallery openings and just um, our building is currently closed to the public and to our membership. So we have over 200 organizations and individual artists that are members of the Tippecanoe Arts Federation that also utilize our building as their, um, as their hub, as their meeting place. So um, since March 16th, we've been closed and as the governor's orders have been updated, we've also um, followed suit with that. We are looking forward to our July 17th gallery walk, which will be the first one that we'll be able to offer and the first time we'll be actually able to welcome uh, quite a few individuals back into our um, back into our Wells building. Um, and then, of course, June 20th, because we are unfortunately unable to hold the physical festival, the taste festival, we're moving it online. So we want everyone to kind of just uh, tune in. It'll be streamed live on, on Facebook and it, it is free. Um, if folks wanna donate, that's great, but we'll be featuring uh, six of our outstanding performers, local performers that I know a lot of folks are missing because um, they're not able to see them in, performing at any venue. So we'll be doing that. And we're also going to be hopefully spotlighting a couple restaurants, demonstrating how they put together one of their signature taste dishes. So um, uh, yeah, tune in and uh, learn a little bit more about the, um, the great resources that we have in the community, um, the great talent that we have. And uh, yeah, and remind yourselves of um, that the community misses you and we wish that we could be right um, back with you. Yeah, so June 20th, everyone. Um, do you know the time yet? Yeah, it's from four till 10. Four till 10 Eastern time, right? Eastern daylight yeah. time. Um, on the Tippecanoe Arts Federation's Facebook account, is that correct? Yep. And then we also have the Taste of Tippecanoe event page and it'll be streaming from there. We'll, all, we'll also be embedding it into our website. So if you don't have social media, you can click on there and see us as well. Wow, wonderful. Look forward to that. It will be on my calendar as well. Yay. So how can we as a campus entity, Tisha, be involved with the Tippecanoe Arts Federation? Or how have you been maybe um, you know, working together and how we can continue and grow in our collaborations? Well, I have found, and I, I think this is probably um, the same for you, that really things that bring us together is like finding that um, a, a level of comfort, right? So I love to share in experiences, um, you know, where food, there was a point in time where food was something that 
would embarrass me very quickly because it mm -hmm. showed off my my upbringing but now it's where i want to sit down and get to know people and really share in in the fact that this is about my culture and this is what it tells you about me so we have because we do live in a diverse community within the next five years of the Tippecanoe Arts Federation, one of our things that we really wanna do is to have like wonderful representation from all of our community members. So in addition to me, we want to be reflective of the community that we serve. So I would encourage folks that if you want to get involved with the tap, with the, with the Tippecanoe Arts Federation, if, if you want to be on a committee, if you'd be interested in, you know, a deep dive and learning about our board of directors, we want to hear from you. You know, I will, I want to sit across from you. I want to learn more about um, the cultures of all the Asian countries. Mm -hmm. And for that sort of, you know, show and tell that that sharing, I think that that builds a, a genuine relationship that I am really personally craving. And um, and I think that more than ever, having that reflected in our community, especially with our organizations is vitally important. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, we are very fortunate to have you and the center here, and we need to take advantage of the fact that not every community has that resource. And so I want to, you know, be able to provide that platform for you and to collaborate on as many efforts as possible so that we can share that and to show, you know, really the rest of the state that we're a model for a community that works together to be better. Yeah, yeah completely. I agree with you. Um, how do you think the arts have impacted, also what is unique about um, Indiana, our two cities, uh, greater Lafayette communities in general? How, how, does, how do you think the art has impacted um, our cultural landscape? And, and actually, I need to mention that some of these questions come from our students. Um, we have undergraduate student ambassadors who work at the art. And this particular one comes from Gwen Condino. So Gwen, thank you for, so much for the question. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a great question. So, um, so, so it, it, let's just talk about like the region of Indiana that we're in. So Tippecanoe County, though um, many of you, especially if you're from a different country, think that Lafayette is really a small city. But for Indiana and for this region specific, it's the big city. And so um, essentially we are surrounded by rural, very um, uh, small populations of individuals that don't have the resources that we do. So one, um, by means of putting <clears throat> public art out, a lot of our communities are experiencing that for the very first time. How that changes the community landscape is that they're never um, thinking about um, the artwork or having that sort of artwork and accessibility in their community or having those conversations that really trigger commerce. Um, but again, when we're looking to be a competitive workplace, recruiting and retaining um, folks, they're looking at the arts to really elevate that. You could go down the side of most Midwest cities and see that there are a lot of um, farms and corn and wheat, soybeans that are being grown. And then in our communities, you're seeing a silo painted um, with a, you know, with a unique piece of artwork. And that has really defined or made people take a look at um, what we're doing specifically in this region. The fact that we're able to partner um, two entirely different sectors, agriculture and the arts, um, to, to really spotlight both of them is a, a unique uh, collaboration that um, because of our strengths in this community, we're able to celebrate in a greater capacity. Um, I also think that, you know, for instance, some of the artwork that we put on Wabash Avenue, um, which hopefully everyone will go out and see those 52 murals that are up and down that street in Lafayette. Um, but so traditionally that community has been um, one that has a really storied past. It was founded by really Irish immigrants that immigrated here to work on the Wabash and Erie Canal and they stayed. After that time, there was an elevation in crime. Um, for instance, uh, gangsters, like gangsters, like, um, you know, like the gangs of New York kind of gang mm -hmm. gangsters there. 
and it became a very unwelcoming neighborhood. Um, and it, it had that reputation of being really crime-ridden and unwelcoming that, it, you know, if it was past this time or you weren't from there, you shouldn't be there. And so if you talk to individuals that have lived in the community for a really long time, they're like, oh, Wabash Avenue. But we worked with the city and Habitat for Humanity and the Wabash Avenue Neighborhood Association two years ago to put this, these murals out there. And what really has happened is that they have drawn on the fact that they can celebrate their history, but also um, the artwork has made it safer. So in our whole conversation about rolling this out for them, you know, I asked the neighborhood association, are you okay with people who don't live here being in the neighborhood? And they had to, and they had to come to um, some sort of um, uh, positivity about having people into the neighborhood. And, and since then, I mean, just in terms of numbers, um, we've seen property values rise from $80,000, like median property in that neighborhood from 80,000 to now 120,000 in just the two years that, that we've done those murals. And um, one of the, well, many of the, what, many of the artists really wanted to not only say, yeah, it, this was built on our, um, on the Irish heritage, but also there is a rich history of Native Americans and the community, this neighborhood into the future will be one that's very diverse. So you'll see individuals like um, that are painted, in, that are people of color. And that's really important because it changes the dialogue of that and makes it, um, again, a more welcoming community for all of us to enjoy. And it's one of the hottest points for public art in our state, so. Mm -hmm. Wow, so the interconnectivity between the, you know, the economy, right, and diversity. You, you just you just said it beautifully. Uh, it, it, it touches everything. And I, and I think oftentimes um, folks don't see the arts as doing that. But what right. we do, we can be a great unifier. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Last question for you. I'm wondering if you can send some words of encouragement for our Purdue community who are watching, um, who are currently having to be maybe away from each other, um because of COVID-19 what are some of the words of encouragement that you would like to say to us uh, I'll be really honest that uh I think your 30s are going to be the best um <laughs> because uh you'll be out of school um because you're going to Purdue you won't have a lot of student debt um because they've been able to keep the um tuition at a level uh that is i think uh, accessible for for a lot of us and that when you're grounded and you're getting this terrific ed education you're going to be employed at a job that's going to afford you the opportunity to um have a, a the home of your choice to be able to experience the rest of the world so please travel taste things that you never have before and just uh you know, really look forward to the bright, bright future that you will have and all of the opportunities that your experience at Purdue and in this community will afford you. Tisha, thank you so much for your generous time. I just love getting to know you. And we'll talk after about how, right, the ARC and um, Speak and Arts Federation can collaborate more and more. But just thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.